I think some students do have some questions about um, their skill level and will that skill level be enough for them to join the courses, either DevOps or DevSecOps, DevSecOps I think so, right? Hello? Yeah, I think uh, the PC, sir, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you are Karthik, I can hear you. Yes. So I think uh, some of the students are, some of them are requesting to know whether uh, if they come with no IT knowledge, can, will the course, can they uh, understand the course, what is happening and will it actually help them in getting the openings, right? Uh, so yes. I, I personally think uh, we have taken a lot of students in last couple of months alone where who are coming in, you know, a lot of people are coming from management roles from IT and who are coming from not non-IT roles as well. Because the way the course is structured, right? Even uh, we start off with very basics with Linux. Then we talk about how the Linux works and how servers are used as a Linux. And we go very uh, gradual way and we cover a lot of bases. You know, there's not, you're not taken into the deep end of the pool at the end of it. So there's a gradually you're taken to the, you know, to what is required. And also the topics that are covered are what is there in the industry on your day-to-day -day job. You know, especially uh, when you're talking about DevOps or pen testing is exactly what happens in the industry when you go, then that is how, and we also will have a discussion about how the interaction with the teams will be and what is your job role and why, why exactly you're doing the task. All those things will be discussed as well in the main course, right? So if you are worried that you're not coming from a proper IT background, you're coming from a non-IT background and will you be able to cope up? Uh, definitely you'll be able to cope up, but there's a certain amount of work also has to be put up from your end. You know, whatever the assignments and whatever the has been taught in the class, if you go back and practice it thoroughly and we'll always be to help you and not only during class hours and certain times you can even connect. If you can put up and we'll have an official WhatsApp group for the teams. Uh, if any questions out there, if you get, if put, if you get stuck, uh, there will be someone to help you guys out there, right? So help you guys out and help you out in a, uh, whichever way it is possible for our end, okay? So that's the thing. So hopefully uh, that answers your question. And uh, let's start off with today's session, you know? So welcome everyone. So, so previously, we have talked, spoke about multiple security things, right? Uh, the, the way it was has been organized. Uh, it is we started off with our you know, introduction, cyber security. We talk about what is a threat and things like that. Uh, we saw the different things that are coming into play of them. Right? What exactly it means to security and what is how we are securing different things out there. And the second stage is where we actually got into something in hot code. The second bit program where we're talking about penetration testing and infrastructure testing and things about, you know, that is where predominantly there's a lot of demand out there. And one of the reasons why security is as a career is a bit more on it, right? It is much more safer career for, compared to some other tech careers is that you need to provide security, right? You can either downsize the number of people working on the project, but it is important for you to have that security in place and you need people in security to do, to be able to do that part of that, you know? So one of the least people who are going to be fired at the last, if there's any problem with the project is going to be the security people out there. And we seen is that, right? We have not seen in the industry, there's a, even though there's a lot of, you know, uh, pink slip being distributed out there in the industry. We are seeing very few people in penetration testing field or DevSecOps field getting involved there. In the third week, we saw like how do you shift left in your cybersecurity, right? 
So penetration testing, we pro we saw the problem with penetration testing was after everything was done, after the application was designed, after the application is live, we are checking the application for any issues, and we saw it is actually adding time to the project and it is causing a lot of issues with that. Even though we are securing the project, securing the application, but it is not working out the way we wanted. So we wanted to secure it at an earlier stage, and that is where we saw the DevSecOps coming into play. Right. So that is the main criteria we saw. But today we'll talk about cloud security. Right. Today we'll talk about cloud security and we'll talk about what is cloud computing like that. Right. So why it's important as a security engineer or a cyber security engineer or a DevSecOps engineer, you need to be aware of cyber security and cloud computing. Why there is a correlation required of that. In today's world, what is happening is that cloud computing provides a lot of advantages, right? And most cloud computing, all the companies, most of all the projects are running on cloud. Uh, even you take your Netflix is also running on cloud and other things. Most of the lot of projects are working on cloud as well, right? So since your applications are running on cloud, it is important to secure them as well, right? But there is a difference. There is a difference between your traditional approach, meaning you're having a server on your in your office and running the services, or you're running a, your server on the cloud and you're running the services. So you might be thinking, what exactly is Karthi talking about? You know, what is cloud exactly does it mean? So let's understand what is cloud, right? So in the simple terms, in the simple terms, what we can think about cloud, right? You can think about it as a someone else's computer. Right? So there's also an official definition for that. Cloud computing is a model for enabling, you know, a convenient on-demand network access to a shared pool of configured computer resources. For example, network, server, storage, applications, and services that can be rapidly provisioned and really released with minimal management effort and server provider interaction. So many. I need to be able to get into the server space and things and all with the least amount of possibility and things like that. See, I think probably this does not make, it actually makes, the definition makes it much more difficult to understand what is cloud computing than rather than understanding what is someone else's computer is. Yeah? Let's try to understand in a simple way. Let me, you know, so let's try to understand what is cloud computing. In a simplest form, in a simplest form, let's assume I am having a server at home, or it can be a desktop as well. Let's assume you are running a laptop and you want to run some particular job, right? That requires a very high CPU, mini or an expensive computer, right? Which you don't have for that. And you don't want to buy an expensive computer or CPU because you need it for only four hours. You need it for only four hours and you don't want to buy it. What you're going to do? Probably you're going to rent it. Or in my case, what you're going to tell is that Karthik, I will connect to your server. Okay. I will install all the tools that I need for running my project. Right. Once the project is run, I'll run the project for four hours. Right. And for this, I'm going to pay you hundred dollars. Right. So now I'll tell, okay, it's fine. So what I'll do is that I'll give my access to you to access my server and run your project. And in fact, that is how cloud computing started into play. Right. So Amazon was doing a lot of, you know, they had a lot of uh, large amount of computers for doing their, you know, for various management and things and all. So they don't use the same amount of computers all the time because depending on the sale of the year, right? So during the December, they are using a full almost all of them. And during mid of you know August or September, the utilization of systems by them servers because people are shopping less at that time. They don't need a large number of servers at that time. So they gave the server to NASA for doing some activity because NASA thought they needed to run some kind of an analytics on some program. They need it for a couple of days only, and they didn't want to invest in a large 
computer wireframe, you know, uh, grid computing technology out there and spending millions. And that is what happened. With them, right. So that is when the Amazon thought, OK, we can give our computers as the rent to others. And that is what is happening on your day to day basis. But you might see now you might see the definition it is telling that it should be sharing a resource and things and everything. So what exactly is happening is that I am taking my system and I'm giving my desktop or my server and into dividing it into many spaces out here and giving each of them them is going to part of it, right? So all of them are going to share. It is going to be quite easy to spin things up or start something up and it is not going to be difficult out there, right? A simple example here is that Cloud computing uses virtualization technology to a large extent. I'll show you an example. I'm using a tool called VMware Workstation. So in this VMware Workstation, you can see here there are multiple virtual machines that are being used out here, right? So I'm using it. I'm running a Ubuntu operating system inside my Windows system. And what this Windows Ubuntu is doing is it is taking a part of my system, right? I'm having a 32 GB of RAM in my laptop. So I'm out of the 32 GB, I'm giving 4 GB RAM to this and about two processor cores to this particular virtual machine and 40 GB of my to totally two terabyte of data space. No harder that I'm being on there. So now I will be able to run all this machine sim simultaneously without having, to, having any issues, meaning every time I'm going to do that. So physically, there is only one system which is running on Windows. Virtually, I am able to run multiple operating systems inside an operating system, right? And that is what happens in your cloud as well. So the laptop here is replaced by an AWS server. And anyone who is going to connect to that AWS server is going to be given a share or a part of the CPU resources on the system resources to them I'm going to do with that part. So what is the advantages of doing this? As you can see here, I can start the server. I can stop the server with a lot more ease. And it helps out. Yeah, with helps out with the process with a lot of things for us, right? I can spin the server. I can if I want to increase one more server, it is not going to be difficult for me, right? Especially the reason why cloud plays an important role is that let's say you are a startup. Right? You are a startup and you want to start a company or you want to start your own IT company. So in traditional sense, what was needed was you need to rent office, right? Even though there are only two people, you need to rent office. You need to purchase servers. Servers can be very expensive. Only the CPU, forget about the server, um, only the CPU can go between the, anywhere between 10 to $20,000. And again, for the servers, we'll need the power or electricity. We'll need the storage or the space for them. Then again, we also need an admin for managing it. The initial cost of getting into a business in cloud in a normal traditional structure is very high. You need to save up a lot and maintaining them. It's going to be very expensive. But on the contrary, let's say if you're having something on AWS, right? All you just need is a credit card and you can start working on your servers. Here you might have to think about what is your performance of your server is going to be down the line one year and probably buy a very expensive server in the end start itself. But here I can go with a very small server and pay less. The less is very, very little, right? It's I think probably around, you know, sometimes you may be paying about one dollar per an hour or something like that. Probably for a hundred dollars a month, you can run me run, running a very good server. And all of this can be done right from working from home. You don't need to purchase in your office space. You don't need any technicians because AWS, AWS will do a lot of things for you. And those are the things that will help you. out. And if things don't work out, all you have to do is cancel your plan. Cancel your 
AWS plan and come out. It's not going to be a very expensive option. You don't have to worry about how do you, you are going to provide notice for the rented office. You don't have to worry, you know, a lot of other things you don't have to worry. So it brings down your market. The jumping into the starting your brand or anything is very easy. And it also helps not only for small companies, it also helps for the large organizations as well. Right? For them, cloud will play a very important role. It, it helps out in a lot of things because let's say they may be working on a particular project. Let's say if the Apple Music, they're having one server out there and all of a sudden there's a hit song. They are going to be facing with 100 million downloads in one hour. So previously they had to purchase a couple of servers and things like that. Now cloud will be automatically will be able to add those on the go without having any issues. Right. So those are the advantages of having a cloud and why cloud makes an important. Right. We see a lot of companies, especially startups and small projects heavily dependent on cloud and we have tested a lot of applications and that is there. Right. And if you remember our infrastructure security, we talk about you may be the web application is working fine, but we also need to secure the servers. And in this case, the server is there in the AWS instance, right? So AWS or Google Cloud or Azure is going to be managing that. So that is what we are going to be worried about that, right? So let's understand what are the different types of clouds that are available out there, right? So here, you know, one of the main advantages is broad network access. So I can have something which can be accessed all over the world. Rapid elasticity, meaning I can increase my number of server count or decrease my server count or performance of my server based on the requirement, right? As in when it comes about that. It is a measured service, meaning I can tell how much service is being used. What are the services I'm using out there? All those things can be managed out here, right? And on demand and self-service, right? You can decide what is, is required by you. And when you want, you can have those services and it is on self-service basis. You don't need anyone coming and sitting with you and things like that. Let's say in the mid of the night, one o'clock, you want to set up your own server. You don't have to wait for anyone. You can go there, pay for the service, start, and that's going to be done with it, right? And also resource pooling. Resource pooling, what is going to happen is that a lot of resources can be used at once and a lot of people can use the same resource. When you're having an AWS server that you spin up an AWS server or any cloud server in that case, that server is not physically a single server out there. There may be one higher grade server just like we saw now there's a virtual machine. That virtual machine is shared with you. There may be multiple resources in it and that is going to be shared among different people out there. Right, that's also there. But important things, even from an interview point of view and from an understanding point of view, service model and deployment model plays in very important. Service model and deployment model plays in very important. Right, so let's understand the three different service models. The first one is software as a service. Second one is platform of a service and third one is infrastructure as a service, right? Software as a service is the most commonly used service. And do you think you may, are you using any software as a service in your day to day life? And if you think you don't, in, you're wrong, right? For instance, your Google G Suite, whatever you're doing, your Gmail, Google Docs and Keep Notes and whatever it is, those are all cloud based services and it is a software as a service, right? If you are a company one who are running their own, you take up your email and G Suite for your employees, then that is going to be there. The reason why it's called software as a service is that you're only managing the software out here. You're not managing any platform, meaning any operating system or any software configuration is not part of you. You're only using the software out there. But let's say you are logging into Amazon and you're connecting to something like that. What we saw 
when uh, VMware, they saw multiple operating systems on Ubuntu, Windows, and other things out there, where you can manage your own operating system out there, and you are able to install your own software in those operating systems. In those situations, those are called as a platform as a service. Meaning, compared to software as a service, you are much more comfortable or much more control about the environment that your service is going to run in. You are managing the Linux users, what software is there in the Linux, is there any Windows operating system, then what software is there, and how do you configure, all those things will be taken care in that part. Okay. But here, one thing you're not doing, you're not dealing with the infrastructure. So meaning, you don't know what is the underlying hardware that is there, what motherboard is there, how many devices are there, how many servers are there, how can I divide that? That is not going to be present out there, right? So that is the thing. In infrastructure as a service, you have a much more cleaner control. In a simple way, we can explain this is that in a day to day, we can talk about from a PISA perspective. Right, PISA manufacturing or PISA center perspective. Software as a service is something like you go to the PISA place and you order a PISA and they'll give you the PISA and you eat that. Other. Platform as a service is more predominantly what is going to happen out there is that you're going to the same PISA place, but instead of ordering it, they will give you all the ingredients that are required for making the PISA. You make your own PISA out there, right? So that is how it's going to be done on them. Whereas infrastructure as a service, everything is going to be on you, right? It, they will only give you the hardware. It may be a stove, it may be an oven, it may be mixing and other things, and everything has to be taken care by you. You are not going to be served anything upfront. You have to use, you have to get your own ingredients and things like that and use the tools yourself. Previously, the ovens were used for making the baking the pizza, but not they were do it, they would do it for you. But now that is not the case out here. So those are the different service models. The infrastructure is very rare. We see platform is something which we use on a daily basis that most of the organizations which are working on cloud uses platform as a service. Software as a service is predominantly an end user approach, right? That we see out there but how it is deployed. So how it is catered to the user, right? So that is what basically we're talking about. It. So here in public cloud is basically we can tell is that AWS belongs to a public cloud center predominantly, meaning there may be one big application, one web, one server, physical server out there. And that physical server is being divided into many organizations, you know? Then maybe 20% of the server is being given to Oracle, 20 is given to Cisco, 30% is given to you know Verizon and things like that. So we can have that is going to be shared in the by a lot of people. At that time, it is called as a public cloud. Similarly, in a private cloud, what happens is that they are going to set aside a set number of servers, and that has been meant for one particular client only. So this is what usually what happens in banking sector that we see out there. And hybrid is something like you may be running, you know, uh, multiple clouds. You may be running one part of your cloud in AWS and other part of your service in Azure or GCP or things like that. So there's a much more combination. Some part of them is in public, some is in private. So it is in hybrid cloud, a mix of many things. Community cloud is something which is much more what is for free to be used by the community and things like that. We see this very less often, right? That is there, right? So now we talk about what is the cloud and what is the different components of a cloud, what makes up a cloud and how do we deploy that, right? So you might ask me, Karthik, you know, who is responsible for security in cloud, right? When it comes to infrastructure, I'm responsible because the server is there in my company, in my premises. So who is having access to that services is going to, I'm going to decide, that, right? And I'm also responsible for that. I should always make sure that 
I should that all the users who are accessing that server as legitimate users and they're only accessing what is required to be accessed by them. But in the cloud, it becomes a bit more complicated, right? So what is going to be that? So in that, we will have to see what kind of a service model is going to be used by them. Now, based on the service model, we'll be able to understand who is responsible for what, right? For instance, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Here you could see here, I'm mostly consumer when it's infrastructure as a service and mostly provider, it is software as a service. Why do you think this is the case? When, when the client is using infrastructure as a service, they are, most of the security is their responsibility. And when we're using software as a service, most of the security is responsibility of the cloud provider. So why do you think this is the case, right? So reason here is that in infrastructure as a service, the cloud provider has very little amount of interference, right? Whereas the software as a service, they have much more higher control over what services and what things that are there. Meaning in infrastructure as a service, they can only give the hardware to them and everything, what software is going to be installed, what OS is going to be installed, how the application is going to be configured and everything is going to be taken care of by the customer itself. So in this case, it is not the responsibility of the provider. The customer is going to be responsible for that, right? In platform as a service, there is a bit less involvement by the consumer compared to previous case because the hardware is no longer responsibility of the consumer. So meaning here the cloud provider is responsible for providing a security at the hardware level, only at the OS level they can, consumer is going to be responsible for. Similarly, in a software as a service, you don't have access to anything. For instance, if you take your Dropbox, let's assume you are a company you are using Dropbox for storing your customer information or whatever that is there. Or you can even take Google Drive for that instance. Are you responsible for providing the hardware security? Meaning that no one get access to that hardware. I'm not responsible for that, right? So am I responsible for on which operating system my Google Drive is working on? I'm not responsible for that. So I don't have to worry about that as well. So how managing security of the operating system is also not my responsibility. Your Google Drive is going to be running or written in coded in some programming language. Are you have doing any modification of the code level? No. So then even at that case, you're not responsible for the security for the code there. So only thing that you can manage here is that in the Google Drive perspective that you're going to decide which Gmail ID will have access to that particular folder. That is your responsibility. You have to make sure that setting that whether that you're making the folder that you created in your Google Drive, it is going to be public folder or a private folder, meaning everyone can access it or only a certain number of people can access it. That is going to be taken care by you. Secondly, it is going to take care of that when the people is accessing what access level they have whether they can read or they can edit, those are the things that is going to be taken into consideration, right? So, but you see the infrastructure, if, you, if I'm giving a server physically, we are going to be responsible for it. So that's the main concern out here. So that is, you have to understand from a consumer perspective, and you have to understand what is the main criteria of that, right? And here you could see, lot of things, data classification and endpoints. When you're having endpoint security on premise, everything is your responsibility. And when it goes to right SaaS and PaaS, and it is going to be more towards the other person responsible for that, right? So PaaS and I see infrastructure again, the responsibility of the consumer is more and the cloud provider is going to be less. Client endpoint production, 
in client endpoint production deals with your laptops or systems that you use to connect into the cloud you know there when you talk about there it is going to be 50 50 access management then again it's going to be pass in sas it's going to be 50 50 but as infrastructure it is your responsibility application level control and things like that okay network control host infrastructure and physical security will all come under cloud provider when you are using pass and sas out there so that's the criteria for this but is this how do i you know so now you know that how do you classify the security and you know what who is responsible for what right who is responsible for what how do i make sure how do i implement a particular security how do we go about implementing the security in these situations right so one way to go here is to use security groups you know Security group is a virtual firewall for EC2 instance to control incoming and outgoing traffic. Both inbound and outbound rules control the flow of traffic and traffic from your instance, respectively. Right. So, if you have seen the earlier you know sessions from our end, we have spoken specifically about firewalls. Right. So it is going to decide how what is going to be done out there. Uh, so here we are going to talk about that. Let's see from a small perspective, right? Let me stop this one there. For instance, if you remember, what does a firewall do? Firewall do firewall is a device, right? That is going to filter the traffic. Right? It can be done in a many way, right? Let's assume this is your server. And if you know all the devices in the internet will have some kind of an IP address. Let's assume this is going to be 11.11.11. .11 and your connecting is your laptop. And your IP address is going to be 12.12.12.12. And let's say there is one more device that is connected. And that device is going to be 15.15.15.15. How do you? Right. So firewall can be decided it can tell allow traffic to pass through if the destination is 11.11.11.11 .11 and the source is going to be 12.12.12.12 .12 meaning any packet going from this particular device is going to be sent to this and if i'm sending any packet from 15 it is going to be dropped it is not going to be allowed so this is one way of knowing, making sure only the right set of people are accessing the server and wrong set of people no longer access for that. In a similar situation, in AWS also provides such kind of a security rules. I can tell that only certain IP address should be available out there. Only certain set of people can access this part or certain set of people can configure my AWS server and that is going to be taken care by the security rule and this is happening at a very you know physical level there aws security groups do manage it in a very virtual way but we're talking in a similar role right so we talk about security groups then let's talk about what are the other things that is important for that? What is the other thing that is important for that? So what is the management plane and why it is important to secure a management plane? So what do you mean by a management plane? Management plane is an interface, you know, that is used for managing your infrastructure. 
for instance. You may be running multiple virtual machines or VPCs in the AWS or any other cloud provider. So you're going to decide whether to start that service, to stop that service. How do you do those activities? That for that, you're going to have an interface for that. Right. And this interface is very crucial. Meaning, if anyone gets access to this interface, they will be able to completely take control of your infrastructure completely, right? For instance, if you take into consideration, right? One second. Right? If you see my VMware workstation here, if I can access, this is something called as a management plane, and this is for your VMware workstation, right? So here, when I come here, I can decide about whether I can start a machine, virtual machine out there. I have to access it and things like that. If anyone is able to access these things out their own, they can control what is happening to the virtual machines in my system. Uh, similarly, in an AWS environment, this is going to be there. You may have to be very careful because they can also not only access, they can also delete this permanently, right? And they can have much more better control also of what you're doing out there. So it is very important that you take care of this. Right? So, so management plane. So how do you make sure? So how do you make sure? Whenever you're going to and logging into your AWS console, so what are the things that you are going to do? It is always important to use a very strong authentication, multi-factor authentication to be precise, meaning you're not only going to use your username and password, you may have some kind of an OTP methodology. You may be having an authenticator, uh, you know, app that is going to, you're going to dual authentication is going to be there. And also make sure what administrator is there, who's there, are you managing them? Are you manage, controlling what they're doing out there? Are you following up what they're doing out there? And it's very important that you check it out there. And it's not only from a security perspective. There are many cases in our job. In my in my company, I've seen an administrator did not take care of things properly. He forgot to, you know, this remove a particular AWS server after it was used, and he forgot, and it ran there for a month or two. They were not about it. And they got charged heavily for that, you know, because it was a high end server and because of his negligence, that could also lead to a financial loss, not only from a physical, right? And also make sure the strong security for API gateways and access to that is also quite high. So don't try to, you know, use a weak encryption when you're connecting to a VPCs and using your management planes out there. That's very much important. The next part that is going to be is infrastructure security. Now, this path is about a lower layer of security, right? So predominantly, for everything that cloud builds from including computer workload, networking and storage, a lot of things are put together, right? It is your responsibility to look at the infrastructure and see what can be done, you know? So make sure a lot of things here, it also comes about configuration. Lot of your servers or AWS resources comes with built-in security, but they are not enabled. For instance, a cloud firewall may be enabled to allow all traffic by default, which is not right. We should also make sure that it, we remove the default configuration of there. Disable any remote access to that. You know, If I'm having any services out there, I should remove any SSH service for non-admin users, making sure that it is not going to be there, right? At the same time, whenever you're creating an image in the AWS, you know, we are making a copy of your operating system, multiple copies, we should always make sure that image is a secure image. That does not have any vulnerabilities in that day, right? We should also see file integrity is also monitored, right? So we should also check out that whenever you're storing some information, that integrity is not compromised. If there's, you should always check. There's something called as an hashing algorithm, and that is going to be important. Right? 
and patching uh, images and not patching running instances is bad sometimes. Uh, nowadays, cloud AWS takes it much more seriously. Uh, recently, what happened was we are running a product on our AWS instance. Anyone can download that product and use it out there. What happened was there was no problem in our product, no vulnerability in our product, but our product was dependent on a Python and Python came up with the vulnerability on that particular time. So they came up immediately and told you got two days to fix it. Uh, otherwise, no one will be able to use your AWS instance for their work. It means that a lot of clients who are currently using will be stopped from using it as well. That was a big problem, right? So we had to get back out there. We have to do all the code changes in our code to meet the newer Python versions. And once that was done, it was fixed out there. But certain times when you have much more control about what you're doing, that patching, checking for vulnerabilities for the software that are installed in your servers and your cloud is very much important. You have to take care of that as well. And also, you need to cover the logs as well. As you might be seeing, a lot of things that I'm talking right now, it is more prevalent to the topics, things that we covered in the first three weeks, right? We'll be covering this in the main courses as well. So we're going, bit, going to be going a bit deeper in there as well out there, okay? So logs and things and all is any activity that is going to happen out there, a log will be generated. Anytime whenever someone user opens up your web service or any service that you're giving, a log is generated. Whenever an administrator runs an admin program or any kind of a command, a log is generated. It is very important for us to store that logs, right? A lot of times administrators will have that logs and they will delete that logs at the end of the day because they think they do, it's not of any use. From a security point of view, these logs are very much important. You know, log analytics is one of the biggest problems that we are facing today. And one of the reasons why when a system is hacked or a server is hacked, we don't know that it is hacked because we are not doing proper log analytics. If someone had done log analytics, that is why it is one of the top security, top 10 security problems we are facing according to the WASP of them, right? And also make sure the traffic between your workstation and the virtual machine or the virtual subnet is restricted. For instance, when you're maybe cloud provides and everything is virtual, right? It's not physically available out there. And even from a networking perspective, the subnets are a bit different, you know? So you may be having three different, you know, departments, a testing department in a production department and a development department. A lot of times what cloud engineers do is that they put all the departments in a single network. And in one of the networks gets hacked, the other networks are also, other departments are also vulnerable to the attack, right? But now in the, if you're a very good quality engineer, cloud security engineer, you'll understand, okay, I should not put everything in a single network. Let me divide them up. Even sometimes there may be no need for that. We still divide it up, right? So that it does not affect the other cases, right? And we have seen that one of the attacks that you see in web application, server side request forgery, it's basically because of that no proper segregation on the network subnet is happening out there. And that is very much important. And implement security groups wherever is possible. That is very much important out there as well. So managing in a lot of things are coming up here. I know in a simple ways, what we can think about is you should be able to update your software to the latest version as, as many times as possible. Right, it is a good uh, practice to check, keep on updating, checking for updates. And usually they do it on the testing server. If everything is going fine, and then they will update the production server. That is there. Make sure that only right set of people can access that right amount of data. That is there. And that you can do using firewall and security group policies and things and all. And that is there. And finally, make sure the locks are properly managed. Right. But this is basically we're talking here is about how do you manage certain thing. Let's say there's a file. Let's say there's a file. Let's say there's a folder in Google Drive. And you're downloading that folder to your, your local machine. 
right? So what if someone is listening to the traffic? What is Lama said? People can look at that packet in the middle. There could be many servers between the Google Drive server and your desktop. There's a, it might be the data may be tra traveling hundreds of kilometers or even thousands of kilometers sometime, right? If the server is in US and I'm downloading from India, every second it's traveling thousands of kilometers before it reaches my desktop. How do you know that no one is looking at that data during the transfer, right? And how do you know that, let's say, when you store data in someone's server, how do you know no one can access that data? And this is where your encryption comes into play, right? Making sure that your data is encrypted while in transit is very much important, right? For instance, when you go open up your, right? When you open your google.com, right? And you can see here in the top left corner, there's always a padlock symbol. And here you can see there's a HTTP spot out here. Right. So what it says is that whatever, you know, I'm searching here and the data that is traveling between me and the uh, Google server and coming back here, no one can view that data, right? Same thing with your AWS and cloud services as well. And anything that you're running on cloud, anything the data is passing through here is going to be encrypted. And anything you're storing in your Google Drive is also going to be encrypted also, right? It is very much important, right? It is very much important that you encrypt your information. It, without encrypting the information, it becomes a very big liability, you know? And uh, it is also certain times by law, you are required to encrypt the data as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll do one thing. Uh, can we take a five minutes break and then we then will continue with the rest of the slides. Is it fine? The is a. Yes, yes, uh, Karthik. Yeah, uh, before we go on a break, uh, anyone is having any doubts till what we have done till now? In terms of cloud security, what are the things? Any questions from there? So Karthik, one question is, yeah. Uh, even if you are going for a SaaS type of, uh, uh, you know, service model, right. uh, yes. What about your data, the company's data, whether they are also getting managed and maintained by uh, the cloud provider, or is it uh, your responsibility for the security of that? Yes. So for this is a very good question, right? So we do a lot of audits for them. A lot of companies and most of the companies what happens is that whether it's a development company or some other company they deal with customer data right again the distribution is going to be different right and they tell you that customer data what they're doing are going to be stored in the aws or it is going to be stored in google drive for them right? nothing else is going to be it will be certain times the data can be very as simple as a simple excel sheet name of the employee their email IDs and phone numbers and their addresses that's going to be there but again that is a data that needs to be secured by the company so who is responsible for what security here right so here whether your come your google drive is encrypted or not that is responsibility of the google uh, when you are transferring data from your google drive to your desktop that is your that is also responsibility of the google is Google Drive software is up to date and there's no vulnerabilities. That is also responsibility of the Google as well, right? Everything that comes into play. But only thing that is going to come to responsibility of the users here or the consumer here is that when you remember there's a Google Drive, you are going to give access to which user out there, right? When you have a Google Drive folder and you're going to give that share folder, you click on that, that is where your responsibility is going to be present out there. Okay, so now okay, that is one. that uh, role based yeah. RBAC. I mean, yes, role based role, authentication. RBAC is going to be there. So, uh -huh. yes, role based access control that is going to be present. 
and that is, that is what I'm telling is in a very simple approach, right? Let's say there is a database out there, MySQL database is out there, and you have installed that MySQL database in AWS. Again, there are multiple ways of going about the responsibilities out there, right? So the more the data, meaning at that time, the admin responsibility is different, meaning there may be three developers and one admin guy. So admin guy will be the only person who can make configuration changes to your MySQL and the developers will be able to add data into that. But when it comes to managing, right, when it comes to managing the version control of the MySQL database, that is going to be AWS responsibility, right? Is it secure or not? That's what the problem is going to be. But in case, let's say, I'm, they are giving you a web server like this, you know, uh, Ubuntu server like this on AWS. And if I install MySQL inside the Ubuntu machine, now the MySQL version control and making sure the MySQL is up to date with the latest patch becomes my responsibility. So in a simple way, you can think is that which person installs the software is going to be responsible for the security of the software, you know. We can take it in that way. Great, Karthik. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question, guys? Okay. Let's take a five minutes break. I think it's a lot of a lot of lot to take in from a cloud security perspective, because cloud is predominantly it's more of a conceptual approach to a traditional infrastructure approach. Uh, it is just changing the way we are doing the activity, right? It is just that instead of doing the activity locally, I'm doing it in a remote machine, okay? Let's have a five minutes break and let's come back and uh, we'll see how it's going to be the remaining part of it, okay? Thank you guys. Let's start again, uh, let's continue. Before we continue, any more questions? Fine, good, good. Let's continue. So before we continue with deploying an identity and access management or IAM solutions, right? So understand, let's understand why, what is the role-based access control, right? What is the role-based access control and why it is important? So let's assume there's a company that is doing sales and let's assume this is a company that is doing sales in electronic items like washing machine, refrigerator and things like that. And they have a common database for storing all the sales information. And they have a database for all the states they are running in, right? Let's say they may be in, they will have a database for all the sales of the products of their products in California. They will have the products for the in Texas and things like that. Now, and as you can see, now there is a classification of data as well, right? Initially, if there is no classification or role-based access control any enabled out there, anyone will be able to access the all the information. Anyone who is logged into the application will be able to access all the information. And this is not something very much important. At the same time, let's say we can put up something called as you know firewall kind of a pattern out there where we are going to do manages who is going to access what data, right? Let's say we are going to tell, let's say Dave is going to be part of San Francisco or California. So he's going to have access all the data to the San Francisco, but he'll not have access to the any other states, right? And similarly, you know, Sam is going to have access to the Texas database, but he's not because he's a Texas based management manager out there. So he'll have data access to that part. When you're dividing the data access based on the roles, it is going to be much more easier, right? So now, because there's a role-based access control, this makes sure that Sam is not having access to the area managed by Dave, and Dave is not having access to the data that is for the area that is managed by Sam, right? But again, role-based access control goes one step further. Instead of assigning, the permissions to a particular username, it will assign it to a role out there. Meaning, let's assume 
they are going to create a role called California manager and they're going to assign all the permissions to that role. Now to make Dave access to all the California information, all they have to do is that they just have to assign him the role that is main for him. And now he will be able to access it completely. Well, similarly, a role is going to be created for Texas manager and all the data that is relevant to Texas will be assigned to that particular role. Now Sam is going to be access for that, right? There could be multiple services out there. It is not just a single database. There could be 50, 20 different databases that are allowed out there and different variations that is needed out there, right? Now think about what happens now if you have individually assigned all those 20 or 30 different uh, permissions to a username, there is a change, right? There's a change from the end, meaning Sam is moving from California, he is moving from Texas to California and Dave is moving from California to Texas. Now the problem there is that they completely, if it is individually assigned, they have to remove everything individually and then reassign it to the new person, right? So first before Sam gets to the California, he has to remove all the permission from Texas. And then if he goes to California, he has to reassign all the California access permission to him. Same way that happens in the for the case of David's. But in case if you have assigned all the permissions to a particular role, it becomes quite easy. All I have to do is that remove that role for the particular user. All the permissions will be removed and add a particular role that's going to be added. In this case, Sam is going to be removed from the Texas management role and then is going to be added to the California. Now, he will lose all the access in a single go for the Texas instead of doing it individually and he will gain all the access in a single step instead of adding it individually. This is a very good approach because it also makes sure that workload is less. It also makes sure there is no human error. Meaning there are cases, sometimes what happens is that a role may not be removed by mistake, right? Or a role may be added extra by mistake. And that is not going to happen in this case. Similarly, same thing is going to happen with, you know, uh, I am in AWS. You can decide which user will have access to what resource and what can be done on top of that. You know, I can tell that this particular user will have access to this particular server and he can do whatever he wants. Whereas the company is maintaining four servers, a particular user will have access to only one server, right? Whereas an other user can have access to the two servers and they can also have access to the company storage space, you know? So all those things are going to be taken care of, right? It is also important in all the places to have a multi-factor authentication, right? Username and password is not going to be sufficient enough out there, right? There are multiple ways that you can compromise a username and password. A uh, lot of phishing mails are there that can lead to compromising the username and password. We will see the different techniques. If you're joining the main course, you will see that what are the different techniques? How do you break an authentication? And how using a multi-factor authentication is also going to be improving out there. It is going to be very easy. For instance, think about if you are tying tying two-factor authentication, meaning you have to enter username and password, and also enter an SMS out there. Chances of a hacker cracking both or hacking both your username and password and SMS is far greater difficult. I'm not telling that it is not going to be impossible, but it makes it a lot more difficult. You know. The main thing about cybersecurity is always that you can never provide an 100% security. Uh, people, a right set of cybersecurity professionals will always tell you that it is never possible to give 100% security, right? Only thing we can make it is to make it more difficult for hackers or malicious intent users from gaining access to it, right? So using a multi-factor authentication will help you with that process, right? It is excellent. Second process is also you need to take care is your endpoint. For instance, we can think, think about endpoints as let's say uh, I'm managing my company's uh, AWS services where I do have access to the AWS 
management plane where i'm acting the dashboard i'm creating the things and everything and aws is excellent they provide all the security i cannot crack into that i need to do all those things like that what if my laptop gets hacked what if the admin laptop gets hacked how do you make sure that it's going to happen not right so that is why protecting it is the everything in that particular chain from where the data stops and end stops you know it is very important right so you have to make sure right when you're getting your compliance important they also check for that that your hard drives are encrypted there is a specific reasons a lot of developers or administrators are given macbooks right the reason is macbook comes with an higher security or you might see critical developers are either carrying a macbook or a lenovo thinkpad carbon series out there the reason is that they come with a built in with a chip that is used for encrypting the data on the hard drive by default right so even if your laptop gets stolen no one will be able to read your data yes the laptop is gone but the data is not lost right data is not compromised that's the main thing out there you will always have a firewall on those things that will take care make sure that no one is able to hack into your devices and do these activities that is there we need to install antivirus softwares in those things right and access control to this is also important right lot of devices comes with biometrics as well laptops at an higher rate instead of using your username and password you can still have multi factor authentication in lot of corporate websites or laptops when you log in you will get an sms or in the maybe built in app that will give out an your otp and when you only when you enter that otp you can get inside the laptop right all those things can be done out there so we have to make sure that your even your endpoints are secure right and we have spoken about enable and monitoring security logs logs play a very important role out there there are certain softwares that are just designed to manage logs one of them is plunk and also you can see aws cloud cloud trail lake is also one of the most commonly used log monitoring tools out there it helps you with a lot of activities right in some cases we have seen some banking sector where there will be a certain department just for managing logs any activity that is daring on the entire company level there may be 100 200 or 1000 employee whatever they are doing it is continuously monitored right they are using their official laptops it is the, it is in right companies right to monitor these laptops if someone is connecting a pen drive that gets logged and gets sent to the you know uh, sim tools are going to capture that and send it to the so sock centers they are going to check out for that if someone is downloading a lot of data or uploading a lot of data from their laptops again that can be monitored to check whether things are going to be there and also you know it also helps you with understanding how the configurations are done right so if it is uh, because a lot of time configuration issues there may be no vulnerabilities and things and in my case which since i've done i've been in world in cyber security for more than 10 years and most of the time if there is not a coding issue the reason why there is a compromise or data was lost is that the configuration was not done properly and logging properly logging it enables to identify such kind of misconfiguration also right okay. it, it also assist people excessive access rights right uh, it is it was observed in some cases a certain user was not supposed to be running as admin user and certain times an application can be designed to log all the activities of an admin user right whatever he is doing out there and we saw that certain things have been executed as but particular user when we cross checked it and we saw that this particular user did not have an access right for that you know there was nothing like that this person hacked in or do anything he was having the access right he was doing it but he was not supposed to be running that access rights there was an issue from an admin guy who forgot to remove the access rights for that particular user right and and he, instead of adding it to someone else he added it to that user and that was the scenario but 
it was logging that helps us identify this scenario was there that a permission was wrongfully assigned to the pub right so it is very important to see logs and lot of companies even now are not focusing more on it right because uh, at least we should have the logs stored somewhere and archived uh, in some cases if you are holding some banking information pci dss uh, you are supposed to hold on to at least 90 days log that is the bare minimum that you are supposed to do uh, that is the reason that comes into play right why companies are looking into that part right and finally configuration is a major problem that we see right one simple example is google maps and you uh, you will see right when you open company website any website in the contact us form there will be a google map when you click on it it will show them where exactly the office is located and things like that that is not a free service actually that is a paid service the website owners have to pay google maps for doing that okay so it is important for that what has happened in recent times what we see we do also check is that there is a particular key that is been there there is no restriction added to that key telling that only the customers web server has access to that key or that particular thing so if you don't do that anyone with that key will be able to use the google map and they can put that key in their website and who is going to get there is no data loss here actually but it's a financial loss right similarly configuration of the buckets we have seen out there uh, not only in terms of configuration of uh, you know there's a data that is stored in s3 bucket they have not added any kind of a security so anyone connecting to that s3 bucket is serve the data of that and that is very much important that leads to a uh, data problem out there and and again you know collaboration teams sharing the data space uh, that could lead to leaking out information they forget to there are cases where the code itself is compromised right the code of the web server which is very much important they because in the they are having two teams working on the same code instead of giving access right exclusively they have kept it open so meaning anyone will be able to look into that that's a major problem and in should default access permissions are never used uh, that is also main right for instance when you go to mysql it is going to log in with the same username and password as for your system that should not be there you should have a separate username and password for mysql and things like that lot of times a default permissions and default rules will be there that is there for a specific reason to make things setting up things easier out there we have to find it right and determine user level access is as what we saw right who has access to what whether they have access to the read write or execute permission some readers uh, some users will only have read permission and some users will have write permissions as well so we have to make sure whom we are giving write permission it's very much critical because they could delete the data write meaning not only to add it is a modification uh, permission meaning i can delete the data as well so we have to be very careful about that right so that is the from a misconfiguration perspective and and it is also important you know that we should regularly audit your cloud services you know, just like you are conducting pen testing on your websites your physical servers and things infrastructure and everything we should always scan and we see very little pen testing we do on the cloud but we do a lot of vulnerability scans we are regularly running there are certain organization uh they are going to run scans every month make sure that it is you know uh, what are there it is actually meant there is no new vulnerability and making sure and all the security procedures are working as intended right so again accessing the logs is uh, audit also should be there uh done regularly you know lot of we're talking about log analytics previously but it talks about analyzing the logs but it does not tell how frequently the logs are getting analyzed right banking sectors are where the critical information is present out there they do it on the spot and they do it on a, a larger basis on a very short basis you know once in a week once in a month 
and everything is going to be done. So it is also important to that you make sure that you are managing the logs and accessing and con con you know analyzing the logs quite often. And it it will help you. It will help you with better management, data access control, and check whether your data security measures are working as intended or. Right? That's the thing. But now, as we go further, we are seeing this security is also being provided as a service, right? Uh, for you, as I told, running a vulnerability scan and doing blog analytics. Large companies can have a, their own dedicated team. They can have a SOC team. It is usually let's I'll tell you a thing for a we worked on a very mini bank, not in you know it's a medium sized bank. It is not too many, about 300 to 400 people. You know have multiple branches in all the major cities. Uh, about I think 400 people maximum out there, right? It's not a big number in terms of organizations, but in that 400 people, 20, 25 people are just meant for managing the logs and alerts that are there. So that is very expensive, right? That is expensive, meaning about 5% of your staff are working on it. It's going to be very difficult, right? It's very expensive out there. So bankings can do because their earnings and their interaction, the data is very important. They will have to shell out that money. But what about small organization, right? Let's say there is a uh, company which is manufacturing T-shirts and selling it online. For them, having a separate SOC team is going to be very difficult. You know, just like having their own infrastructure. The reason why they move to cloud is that they don't have to have their on-prem servers and things like that. They are because they're running their entire operations from a garage somewhere, or they're in their plant itself. You know, my way they are printing the. Uh, office space that is there in somewhere there's one couple of laptops they're working on it having a dedicated team for that is going to be difficult so in order to overcome this nowadays we are seeing security as a service as well you know so here we are outsourcing the cyber security to the cloud service provider and where they're going to give data about like how do you secure your voice how do you secure a database and general network security and firewall management and things and all they'll take care and then also take care about your firewall, antivirus and things like that, right? For instance, nowadays, if you take your uh, antivirus, you can buy many licenses and you can have a single place where you can manage all the devices and you can see the health of those devices, like how, what is the virus protection level and things like that. And they become much more cheaper, right? Previously, I have to go to individual systems, open it then and see what is happening. Are there any viruses, log analyzing, and it was very difficult. Now it makes very simple. All it has to be done is that I have to log into a central portal and I'll be able to see is that, right? So why? What is the advantage of it? One thing is it is going to be cost saving, right? If you are doing it manually, you're not you're spending not only from a cost perspective, it's more expensive. Think from a timing perspective, you're paying an, uh, an highly expensive technical person to do a lot of mundane tasks and he's paying, you're getting charged out there. So that can be reduced. You always have access to the security experts and to the latest security tools and updates, right? You may have a very good technician, but he may not be known what are the newest threats, what is the newest land problem, landscape problem that you're facing out there, vulnerabilities that are there. So you'll have to do a lot. He, that technical person has to do a lot of research on his own. And even after that, he might find himself short sometimes. So going with security as a service, the companies will take care of this, uh, especially for instance, like in an antivirus, whenever the new virus, all the antivirus companies will share the data. It is only a matter of time, which company is going to give a better, who's going to give you a first uh, solution for an antivirus, you know? So again, faster provisioning, uh, it is much more easier to, let's say if I want to install additional software, additional antivirus or in additional cybersecurity tools on my endpoints or a different servers, it's quite easier. All I have to do is that connect to that service and, and this security as a service will help me do all those things, right? Similar to like adding an antivirus in your any of your, all your machines is as simple as that.
you know and simpler in-house management you don't need a complex team to manage security now lot of your processes can be done with with a little amount of from your end little amount of work from your end you'll be able to achieve a lot of things for because the security services take care of all those things right so one of the things what we've seen is that aws provide a ddos protection all you have to do is that enable it and they will take care of that you can configure it where it can be done but you don't have to really worry about understand how a ddos is working and things it will take care again firewall is taken care by that then again there's something called as a waf web application firewall that is also will be taken care by your aws server you need to know how to configure some basic stuff so that you don't need to have an expert for instance in you know if you take in a us a guy who is an expert in web application firewall someone who is expert in configuring it will charge you know their salaries for them range about 100 to 120 or 130000 dollars that may not be possible for a small company and this tools is going to help you out tremendously you know as we can see here it is always cyber security is not one single shop or one single thing that you are going to do and you are going to be secure it is always about multi layer of stuffs and adding more things to that and doing multiple steps in a particular way right you are see, we are seeing the breaches quite often nowadays but trust me the breaches have gone down much less compared to what previously we never knew there was a breach that was the frightening part nowadays we are seeing that because there is more layer of security into that so that is one thing and adding more layer of security is going to make it more difficult for hackers to gain access to your system and it is also help you with your customer trust and things and other things as well right so these are the things that we need to take care when you are dealing with cloud security right and some of the things there are a lot more other things are there but this will get you in understand it's a very good starting point that this is sorry okay so any questions guys any questions till now what we have done So, any uh... yes, I have a question. Yes, Alex. Um, okay, I do see that um, back in the day there were used to be um, traditional cybersecurity experts, right? Okay. And now that since the, the, there's this move to the cloud. Do you believe the roles um, sort of change drastically compared to um, traditional cybersecurity experts to um, cybersecurity experts now in the cloud, especially um, now with DevOps in particular? Yeah, yeah. so no, uh, not exactly. Uh, it is going to add few things into that, but traditionally mm -hmm. what are the roles or what are the activities that you are going to perform? You are going to mm -hmm. still perform in that case right now. Uh, in, for instance, example, you say when you're having a cloud, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm running my server in Ubuntu server in my virtual machine. Let's assume this is running in a physical server in my office premise. There's a bare certain steps that I need to do on this server to make it more secure and making sure that is there. So it, it's irrelevant whether I'm running this particular server on on-prem server on AWS those things are mandatory to be done by me mm. okay so only thing that is going to be added here is that you are going to have the traditional approach and those things has to be done but now along with managing my server ubuntu server out there i should also see how i'm going to manage my access to the aws console and things like that right so mm. am i giving any permissions who is accessing that things into play so that is what is going to take into account out there. So it is not traditionally, you're just upscaling yourself. You're dealing with bit mm. more information to secure. Uh, that is right. And like, for instance, let's say now, uh, simple example, 
when you come into DevOps part, so what is going to happen now? Let's say you're having your production server now, right? So this is, let's say you will go in xyz.com is here. And previously I was only worried about securing this particular server, right? Mm -hmm. So now what is going to happen is that the, the developer's laptop who is doing the coding, I'm securing that. Where the developers are storing, they're storing that code in GitHub. So I have to be focused on how do you secure this? And where is the code getting downloaded? It is getting downloaded on my CI CD pipeline server, right? So now again, the CI CD pipeline, now it is going to the Docker Hub for what? Docker Hub for your Docker images. So now I have to secure here. I'm giving Ubuntu server securing. Here I have to see how do I secure my Ubuntu Docker images out there. Then again, I'm also in traditionally, I used to run DAST and SAS tools here manually, like testing out here. But now what I do is that I'll bring this part from here to my CI CD pipeline, right? So I'm moving certain things in before the testing case is occurring, and there are certain things that are added out there, okay? So, but whatever the server security I'm doing out here, I'm doing it same way here. But other things we got to see is that from a Docker Hub security perspective, from a GitHub security perspective, we need to be a bit more. And certain things, it's been improved also. When we come into CI CD pipeline, it improves the security uh, because uh, from a Docker Hub perspective, when you're having the latest Ubuntu and every time you have new changes, right? New changes are happening. You're building a new image, right? And new image you're taking from the Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu Docker, for instance, which is the latest image, which is much more secure. So compared to my traditional approach where I had to update my Ubuntu server physically manually every time, and that is not an issue anymore, right? So the process, uh, the, it is going to change the way we are looking at it, but you're still going to do the traditional things are still going to be continued up there, right? Uh, that's the thing. So one more example for this is that a lot of people will ask me like, you know, when it comes to mobile hacking, right and your website hacking what is the difference right i ask them one thing when you're connecting to an let's say you're having xyz.com bank is there right you're connecting you're opening your account details and seeing what is the thing so you may be checking your account details from your mobile and you can maybe checking your account details from your browser in both the cases you're connecting to the same server mm -hmm. right so the 80% of the security or the attack phase or how the attacker is going to do is going to remain the same. Only in the mobile part is that the way the apps are designed, it is going to change. I have to upgrade myself to understand how the apps are working and understand the Android or iOS frame structure, uh, working structure and see can I put any attack uh, attack into that place out there, all right? So those are the things, but rest of the things is going to remain the same. Okay, that's yeah. it. Thank you. Right. Any other question, guys? So the business, I think that concludes our uh, you know, four week cybersecurity internship. Hope you guys had a wonderful time out there. And uh, please feel to uh, please please feel free to put up any questions that is related to cybersecurity internship or the main course. You can ask us now or later on the WhatsApp group as well. Uh, some of us will be able to help you out with that. So anyone will be able to connect with you or answer your audio questions. Right. Uh, Karthik, uh, thank you very much for all your effort and for the brilliant sessions that you have taken, all the four sessions. Are we also going to learn CISSP? Sorry, I'm sorry. CICD pipeline. Is that uh, one yes. of the talks in this yes, class? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in the main course, it's going to be taught as well. So there in the CI/CD pipeline, we are going to use a Jenkins uh, tool for running the CI/CD, uh, where we are going to run multiple tools for 
static code analysis we are going to use sonar cube and for dynamic code analysis we are going to use voga zap out there and again we are going to use trinity scanner also to scan for any vulnerabilities um, in uh, in your docker images and things like that and also one more tool is there for sync for checking any vulnerability in the softwares that are used in that you know when you run an application there are a lot of tools that are used like uh, other uh, like javascript jquery bootstrap and things what if they <coughs> you check vulnerabilities in them on a regular basis uh, the sca tools are going to be used as well and that is also going to be part of the main course what is the duration of the main course uh, it is going to be six weeks 60 okay. hours crazy it's a 60 hour session right sir uh, yes, you are correct. 60 hours. So two hours per day from Monday to Friday. For uh, six weeks, yes. Recently, we have just uh, we had had one one session for, with a new batch uh, started. On Friday. OK, just that was an introduction. It has just started, so that will continue for another six weeks. Yes, that the intro part is open uh, is conducted there, so there is an orientation session has been completed. So we have not yet uh, started the main technical part. So that is going to start from Monday. Uh, that is going to be there. So any more questions guys from the technical part what we have done in the it may not have to deal with current uh, session as well in the previous three sessions also if you get any doubt you can let us know yeah i just wanted to verify what is needed to join the main program which already started oh uh, i think you have to register and you can join for that i think you can check with menon yeah, yeah, he'll be able to help you out with that. Uh, from a technical point of view, I think you'll need a laptop uh, which can run multiple virtual machines. I think that's it because we start from a very basic perspective uh, where we introduce you to the Linux and then we talk about basic commands and things like that. And then we also look at services that are there that could be there, you know. So predominantly about 30% of the course is going to be orienting or the students on the underlying technology and what happens in a real time scenario and how an application is run. So from there onwards, we then move on to uh, cyber security or penetration testing and then we move on to the other things.